It began with a prayer. It began with a prayer of a husband on behalf of his barren wife. We don't know the content, we don't know the time, the posture, the place of the prayer. But we know that it was effective. We know that God heard the prayer and we know that he, he moved as a result. And not only, not only was the couple blessed with a child, but they were blessed with twins. That's some effective prayer, isn't it? But from very early on, we learn that there was a struggle. There was something going on because, and I don't understand how this works, but I believe it to be true because it's in God's word. But we learn from even in the womb, these twin boys, they struggled with one another. Man, I don't know about you, but I got a couple boys and they fight and they, they nag at each other and they bicker and they, they get at one another. But man, when they start in the womb, that's starting early, isn't it? Even when they, even when they were born, as, as the first child was delivered, as, as Esau came out, his brother Jacob was was grasping at his heel. And God's word tells us that the two boys would become two nations. That they would be rivals and one nation would be stronger than the other and that the older son would serve the younger. And as you're looking through the book of Obadiah, it is not in there, okay? I'm, I'm, we're, we're getting there, okay? Bear, bear with me for just a few minutes. And as these boys continued to grow, they chose two separate paths. See, Esau, Esau was a man of the open country. He was a man of the wild. Esau loved to hunt. He was a skillful hunter. He loved to pursue the, the catch, whatever that was. He loved that pursuit. Esau loved the taste of wild game. And my guess is, is that Esau was probably athletic, lean, and strong. He probably had, he probably had a six pack. He probably had well-defined abs and he probably had a chiseled jawline. That's just my guess. That's who I see when I think of this skillful hunter who liked to go out and kill wild game. My guess is, is that Esau, he loved to watch John Wayne movies. He was a man's man and he was his father's favorite. Now his brother, East, I'm sorry, his brother Jacob, his brother Jacob, he was, he was quiet. He was more reserved. He, was, he would like to stay home, stay close to home and live more of the, the domestic type of life. But he was smart. He was crafty. He was quick to use his brain over his brawn. And man, he was a great cook. He knew how to prepare a meal. And my guess is, is that if Esau were to, were to stay at home, he probably would be found watching HGTV. He was his mom's favorite. Now one day, Esau, as he returned from, from a hunting trip, he returned famished. He was starving he was hungry. And as he got closer to the house, he began to smell something. And this aroma, as it began to enter into his nostrils, it smelled so good, it, it started to give him pains deep in his stomach. And he was starving, he desired something to eat. So I can imagine that the picture in my mind of who Esau was, that he probably ran up onto the porch and busted through the front door because he knew, he knew by the aroma, there's no one in this house who can cook stew like my brother Jacob. So my guess is he busts through the front doors, 
found his brother, said, brother, give me some of that stew because I am starving. If I don't eat, I'm going to die. Jacob is crafty, witty as he was, saw this as his opportunity to seize the moment. He said, sure thing, brother. I will share with you some of my stew, but it's gonna cost you. It's gonna cost you your birthright for one bowl of stew. Now see, I've, I've read that before and, and I'm familiar with that story and I've always thought to myself, and I've been hungry, but my guess is that we don't, we don't experience hunger like, like, like many in this world experience hunger. So I probably can't completely understand it, but I've been hungry before, but I don't know that I've been hungry to the point of death. And the other thing that we need to keep in mind here is, is that Esau and Jacob who was their father? Their father was Isaac. Whose father, who, who, was fa who was Isaac's father? It was Abraham, right? Well, let me tell you something. Abraham, Abraham was a rich dude. How rich was he? I don't know how rich he was, but the scriptures tell us that he was very rich in livestock and in silver and in gold. And the scriptures also tell us that everything that Abraham owned got passed down to his son, Isaac. And it says in scripture as well that Isaac, that he was very wealthy, that God blessed him. His wealth continued to grow. He was so wealthy, I don't know but he was so wealthy that his neighbors, the Philistines, they wanted him out of there because he was so wealthy. He was so wealthy that the king of that time, the king said, you need to leave because you are getting way too powerful. So he was rich. But see, the birthright that Esau gave up for one bowl of stew, it was more than just about physical possessions. Although we probably could have stopped there and we probably all could have said, are you serious? He gave up all of that wealth for a bowl of soup? But see, it went deeper than that. It was, it was, it was more than that. It wasn't just about the physical things. It wasn't just about the treasures. That the family name and the titles, they got passed down from generation to generation through the eldest son. That whoever, whoever possessed that birthright, that was the, that was the son that, that the covenant went through. So there was, we've heard this before, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Wait a minute, but Jacob was the younger. He wasn't the eldest son. But it, we hear it as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So here Esau gives that up as well. Jesus, Jesus came through that lineage, right? So Jacob later was, was renamed Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, lineage of, of, of David, lineage of Jesus came through that. Esau gave all of that up as well. And at this time, it was before God had, had set apart the Levites to act as the priests. And this is what I find, this is what I find very interesting. And I wonder if there's more to this than what we even know. But the eldest son, as part of inheriting the birthright, they were the one who would take on the priestly responsibility of the home as well. And Esau says, man, I'm gonna kick it to the curb on a bowl of soup. I am hungry and I'm gonna trade it, all of it, for stew. And, and we sit here and we, how, how is that possible? I, it doesn't, it doesn't equate, it doesn't make sense. But the book of Hebrews sheds a little more light onto this. Hebrews 12, 14 through 16. It says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. 
Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. This passage in Hebrews, I, I think, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear of, of what, what I think we could learn already out of this story, but that Esau was a godless man, that his actions, we could conclude based on his actions alone, that he was not interested in a relationship with God. You see, the birthright for him, there was no value whatsoever in it. And so in his mind, why not at least get a bowl of stew? Why not at least get something in return? Because I don't really care about this. I'm willing to give it up for a measly bowl of stew. The end of that passage of scripture in Genesis 25, verse 33, it says that Esau showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn son. And if you're like me, I had to look up the word contempt. What are some other words that, that contempt um, you could put in there? Dislike, disrespect, disapproval, or hatred. You imagine that? Hatred for his rights as the firstborn son. And to Esau, there was nothing sacred about his birthright. Nothing at all. So as we, as we have the, the luxury of peering into the story, we can sit here and we can shake our heads in disbelief and just, how did this happen? Who in their right mind would make these decisions? But we have to pause. We have to be careful here because we do it. We, we do this very thing. Now, maybe we don't do it on a daily basis. Maybe we do. But how often do we trade something that is godly for a measly bowl of stew? How often do we trade something of eternal value for something that's temporary? How often do we trade something that is spirit-filled for something that is fleshly? How often do we trade Jesus for the world? And how often do we trade something that will last for generation to generation? We trade that for something that won't last past today. How often will we do that? If we move forward several chapters in the book of Genesis, and then we'll, we'll, get, to, we'll get to the book of Obadiah. Genesis 36, it gives us the account of Esau's descendants. And what does it say? It says that Esau's descendants, that they are known as Edom. They are known as Edom. And before you all get up and walk out and say, well, I thought we were in a series on the minor prophets. What are we doing in Genesis? We, we, we've got to know all of that before we get to the book of Obadiah because when we open up the book of Obadiah, man, get, get ready for a left hook because it starts out pretty straight, pretty direct. So the history of the book of Obadiah, really, you, 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 just, you just heard it. We, we don't even know really who Obadiah was. There were some men in the Bible named Obadiah, but it seems like all of, the, all of the scholars out there, they don't believe that any of them named in the Bible were actually the, the guy who actually wrote Obadiah. And since the writer didn't really give us any clues, since Obadiah didn't say, I'm Obadiah, son of Jebediah, son of Fred, son of Bob, um, living from South Whitley, Indiana, we don't know really who Obadiah was. But you know what, here's the thing. is my guess is that was intentional. 
My guess is, is the reason Obadiah didn't include any of that is partly because of the message that he was to bring. So let's, let's look into the book of Obadiah. Let's open it up. Now, if you're like me, um, you're like, oh, Obadiah, oh, wait a minute, I'm trying to remember Genesis, Exodus, where does Obadiah fit in? And Obadiah is maybe one or two pages. So it's pretty easy, pretty easy to flip right by, right by it. But if you see Amos, you see Jonah, you've either gone too far or, or, or not far enough. It's, it's right smack dab in between. But it's probably about a page in your Bible. It is the shortest book in the Old Testament. And I had it marked first hour and I took that out, so I'm gonna have to find it myself. There it is. Page 1470 in my book. I'm not using a pew Bible, so I'm sorry. But I am using the NLT just like, just like you have in the pews, in the chairs. Verse one says, this is the vision that the sovereign Lord revealed to Obadiah concerning the land of Edom. Who's Edom? The descendants of Esau. We have heard a message from the Lord that an ambassador was sent to the nations to say, get ready everyone. Let's assemble our armies and attack Edom. The Lord said to Edom, I will cut you down to size among the nations. You will be greatly despised. No pleasantries, no God bless everyone, um, send you all glad tidings and peace. No, this is what we get right out of the chute the left hook, okay? The Lord said to Edom, I will cut you down to size among the nations. No mixing of words here. Why is this? What's the, what's the reason for it? Verse three says, you have been deceived by what? By your own pride. Edom, you have been deceived by your own pride because you live in a rock fortress and make your home high in the mountains. Who can ever reach us way up here, you ask boast, boastfully. See, the, where they lived, they lived in this mountainous region and it would be very difficult for their enemies to infiltrate, to come in and defeat them and overthrow them. So they felt very secure, very complacent, if you will. They were fine just with where they were and who they were. But even if you soar as high as the eagles and build your nest among the stars, I will bring you crashing down, says the Lord. I don't care how high you think you are, Edom. I don't care how, how nestled in you think you are, Edom. I am the Lord and I will bring you down because you have been deceived by your own pride. What does God think about pride? Very quickly, three passages of scripture. Proverbs 8, 13. We start here and we learn that God hates pride. God hates pride. And if we take the next step in James 4, 6, it says that God opposes the proud. Not only does he hate pride, but God opposes the proud. And then if we take it another step further in 2 Corinthians 12, the apostle Paul, who if there ever was someone who lived a human life besides Jesus Christ, if there was ever someone who had reason to boast, who had reason to have pride in themselves based on who they were, their family lineage, their knowledge, the, the wisdom, the direction that God had given them, if there was ever someone who could boast in themselves, it would be the apostle Paul. But no, Paul says, Paul says, I, I was given this, it was given me this thorn in the flesh to keep me from being conceited so that so that I don't lean on my own understanding, that I don't lean just in myself and what I can do, but I've been given this thorn in my flesh to remind me that I need to lean and be dependent upon God. And sometimes, sometimes God allows things like that to happen. He allows things like that into our lives 
And sometimes we need those things in our lives to keep us from being prideful, from being focused inward, from being focused on ourselves. Verse five says, if thieves, if thieves came at night, talking again, still to Edom, if thieves came at night and robbed you, what a disaster awaits. They would not take everything. If a thief, if a thief would come and rob you, they wouldn't clean your entire house out. They wouldn't take everything. They wouldn't take your home too. What would they do? They would come in and they would, they would take your money. They could find some. They would take your valuables, maybe your jewelry. They might take your big flat screen TV. They might take other electronic devices. They might take things of value, but they're not gonna take any everything. They're gonna go in and they're gonna take what they want. Next verse, just a second here, stick with me. Those who harvest grapes always leave a few for the poor. Back in the book of Deuteronomy, we see where, where the people were told as they harvested wheat, the grain, as they harvested grapes, if, if there were some to fall, they were to leave those. If, if, they, if they came in of an evening, had their bath, got in bed and said, oh, man, I forgot, I left a bundle of grain out there in the field, they're told to leave it for the foreigners, for the orphans, for the widows. But your enemies, Edom, will wipe you out completely. It's not gonna be like the harvest where some get left behind. It's not gonna be like you being robbed where they'll leave some stuff no, Edom, it says that every nook and cranny will be searched and looted. Every treasure will be found and taken. All your allies will turn against you. They will help to chase you from your land. They will promise you peace while plotting to deceive and destroy you. Your trusted friends will set traps for you and you won't even know about it. At that time, not a single wise person will be left in the whole land of Edom. No one will be left. No one will be spared. Everyone on the mountains of Edom will be cut down in the slaughter. So you ask the question, why? Why such judgment against Edom? Is it solely because of Esau and his actions and this, this lineage? Well, we, we, we just read that Edom, how they treated the nation of Israel, who really should have been close allies with them because of Esau and Jacob. But no, there was hatred towards them. So Edom, not only did they, was there violence against their close relatives, Israel, and they did nothing about it, but they refused to help them when they were invaded. They gloated over their hardship. They rejoiced in the suffering of Israel. Edom spoke arrogantly against the nation of Israel. Edom plundered their land. They seized their wealth. Edom even participated. They killed those, some who, who were fleeing. Some were handed over. So, so some of the survivors of, of Israel tried to take refuge with Edom, but no, Edom handed them back over to their captors in times of calamity. With friends like that, with allies like that, who needs enemies? Verse 15. The day is near when I, the Lord, will judge, not just Edom, but all godless nations. As you have done to Israel, so it will be done to you. All your evil deeds will fall back on your own heads. Even though many have come against the nation of Israel, even though many continue to come against the nation of Israel, they are God's chosen people and there will always be refuge for those who escape. But for Edom, for Edom, there will be 
no survivors. Get all the way down to the end of verse 18. There will be no survivors in Edom. I, the Lord, have spoken. I don't know about you, but I find it very interesting here that there is no talk of repentance. There is no talk of forgiveness. There is no talk of a second chance for the nation of Edom. God says, I have spoken. And see, here's the thing, is whether, whether we look at the life of Esau, when it was his struggle with his brother Jacob, or whether it's the nation of Edom and their struggle against their family, their friends, their allies, the nation of Israel. There's just this, this thread of pride that not only we see in the life of Esau, but that we also see in the lives of this nation of Edom. And if there's, if there's one word, if there's one message that I believe that we pull out of the book of Obadiah, it, it is pride. It's pride and it's this idea that pride blinds us. That pride blinds us from our relationship with God. See, as we begin to allow pride to get more of a foothold in our lives, our dependency upon God becomes less and less and our dependency and our pride and our arrogance towards self gets greater and greater. Now, what, what is pride? I believe that pride can, can, can show its ugly head in many different ways, whether it's arrogance or boastfulness or, or being conceited. I believe we have plenty of that type of pride in the church. There's plenty of it outside the church, but there's plenty of it within the church. But what happens when, when pride gets in the way of our relationship with God because we begin to focus more and more on ourself and depending on what we can do and all that we can do and our dependency and our reliance upon God becomes less and less. We choose self over surrender. We choose self over submission because pride blinds and it can have a devastating effect on our relationship with God. How are you doing in this area? I don't know that we wake up every morning and say, hmm, am I being prideful? Was I prideful yesterday? Pride's one of those things that it's not the easiest, it's not the easiest to identify. It's not the easiest sin to pick out, to point out, whether it's in someone else or even if it's in your, even if, if it's within you. It's difficult sometimes to know when we're struggling, we're, we're wrestling with pride. It seems like it's one of those things that can, can creep up on us. And before we know it, we are just filled with pride. I think one indicator is our prayer life. What does our prayer life sound like? Is, is our prayer life filled with, with small phrases like, God, I, I need you. God, I, I can't do this without you. God, I, I give you control. God, may your will be done. Not mine, may your will be done. Because Satan would like nothing more. He would like nothing more than to, than to, than to put a wedge and to help us to forget about God. And as we begin to turn inwardly, we begin to focus more and more on self we become self-sufficient, we become self-reliant, self-satisfying, self-sustaining. We find out that what we have with God, it's not a relationship, it's not a covenant, but if we let pride go to the fullest extent, pride's just an agreement that we have. We can come and go as we choose, we set the terms, we set the limits, 
We don't have to surrender. We don't have to submit. So in essence, what we do is we slowly and surely dethrone God and we replace him on the throne. Pride blinds us. It not only blinds us from our relationship with God, but it also blinds us from those closest to us. And I believe this is never more evident than in these two stories, the story of Esau and Jacob, and in the story of Edom and the nation of Israel. But it's relevant for us today as Christians and in the church. Because you see, God created us to be in community with one another. But more and more today, we see less and less commitment in this thing called community, in these, these gatherings that I will call them. I'm not talking about just church, just Sunday mornings, but I'm talking about gatherings together where we come together and we encourage one another. We come together and we challenge one another. We come together and we speak truth and love to one another. There's a disturbing trend in our culture today where we are doing that less and less. We are less committed to these gatherings than I believe ever before. Yes, I believe God did call us to send us. But I think our church culture today seems to be trending towards this idea that gatherings, that they're optional. That it may be a, a second option, a third option, maybe even a fourth we can wrap and package up our absence in unique ways, but our pride really just ends up hurting our own families and it hurts those who are depending upon us. See, pride blinds. The last point here is, is that I believe that pride blinds us from what we hand down to the next generation. I, mean, I think about that story of, of Esau and Jacob and I, I just think, man, what regrets, what regrets would I've had? If there was ever someone who, who might say, can I have a do-over? It might be Esau. But I go back to this passage in Hebrews that we read earlier that says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See, I truly believe that cycles can be broken. I do, but just, just because someone's father or mother lived, acted, did certain things, doesn't necessarily determine how a child will act. But it does sometimes seem like there is a connection. And here with Esau and Edom, it seems like there is a direct connection. The pride of Esau and the pride of Edom So here's your chance, church. Here's, here's your chance this morning. I can't remember ever studying the book of Obadiah. I can't remember hearing a sermon on the book of Obadiah. I've heard messages on pride before, but I've, I've not heard them on this book. But here's our opportunity. Because if, if, if we continue to read on in the book of Obadiah, it says, but Jerusalem will become a refuge for those who escape. Israelites, not, not, not Edom, Israelites. It will be a holy place. And the people of Israel will come back to reclaim their inheritance. The people of Israel will be a raging fire. Edom will be a field of dry stubble. The descendants of Joseph will be a flame, roaring across the field, devouring everything. But there is hope for God's people. There is hope for God's people. We, we have the opportunity, we have the privilege, if you will, of being challenged by this book, being challenged by the words of Obadiah, being able to, to have the opportunity 
to ask the Holy Spirit to search us, to peer deep within us, in our minds, in our hearts, in our soul. Holy Spirit, peer in us. And if there was any seed, any, any small bit of pride within us, may we confess it and may we repent and may we receive the forgiveness that we can have because of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. So I've got three questions, three reflective questions. I wanna give you an opportunity. I wanna give you just a few moments to allow the Holy Spirit to peer into your soul. Think about these three questions. The first one is this, is there something Is there anything more important in your life than your spiritual birthright, than your relationship with God? Is there anything in your life that's more important than that? What is, what is your bowl of stew? What is it that you find yourself at times trading your relationship for? Are there times in your life when you find yourself more possessed, more focused on making a name for yourself than making a name for God. The second question is this, is there, is there anything, is there any secret pride in your life that you know of that just needs to be confessed, that you need to repent? And you may sit there and say, hmm, nope, I'm good. Man, I, I, I encourage you these next few moments, allow the Holy Spirit to, to move. Because our options are pretty clear. As we read this book of Obadiah, we see other places in scripture that says God has no tolerance for selfish pride getting in the way of him being God. And the last question is this, probably the most troubling question that I've kind of wrestled around with in preparing for this. Is there ever a point of no repentance? We've heard the phrase, the point of no return, right? But what about the point of no repentance? I didn't read about repentance. I didn't read about a second chance. I didn't read about an opportunity for Edom. I mean, my guess is they had an opportunity But there comes a point, there comes a time when we get past the point of no repentance and we allow pride to overcome us, to overwhelm us, to overtake us. And we may not even know, but we've allowed it to seed so deep within us that we can't even recognize it. But it's troubling to think about, is there ever this point of no repentance? Friends, this morning for us, I would say, I would say there is, this opportunity is now, it is today, it is here this morning. Allow the Holy Spirit to move, to peer into your soul. And if he recognizes something in you, be willing to confess it, be willing to repent of it, and be willing to receive the forgiveness that Jesus died for. These next few moments are yours.
Holy Spirit, thank you for meeting with us. Thank you for for the work that you do in us to change and transform us because we know that we have not arrived. That we not only want to lead other people and to be fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ, but we desire that for ourselves as well. We want to be fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And we can't do that if we allow pride into our camp. So Spirit, as as you have made it clear to us in areas that, that we need help, that we need to change, God, may we, may we speak it for what it is and truly confess it as the sin that it is. But not just confess it, but repent of it. That we run from it, that we, we run in the opposite direction of pride and we pursue you with all that we have. And we thank you this morning for the, the opportunity that we have for forgiveness, the opportunity that we have to receive the forgiveness of our sins and that you will purify us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, who has defeated death, that we pray these things and receive your forgiveness, purification, and cleansing. It is in his name that we pray all these things. And all God's people said,